Okay. Yes. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. I uh, want to thank you all for joining us today. I know that everyone is really um, has constraints on their time right now, but um, today we wanted to talk to you about appealing a reduction, denial, or termination of Medicaid managed care services. We prepared and scheduled this webinar prior to the COVID crisis. So the information we're gonna be sharing with you today obviously is based upon a normally functioning Medicaid system, which I have faith we will get back to at some point. Um, but over the last few years, I'd have to say that this is one of the issues where DRNJ has received the most requests for assistance. So we still believe it's an important topic for us to cover. It is a situation, however, that individuals or their representatives can manage and often resolve on their own when they're equipped with the right information. So that is what we wanna provide for you today. And we will have some time at the end for a Q&A. Next slide, please. So let me introduce you to the DRNJ staff that you will be hearing throughout this webinar. I am Jill Hogel. I'm the managing advocate of our community inclusion issue team, and I'm the coordinator of our PAD grant, which is our grant for protection and advocacy for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. My partner on that issue team and supervising attorney is Michael Brower. He is also the coordinator for our PAIR grant, which is protection and advocacy for individual rights. And last, but certainly not least, is Mike Marotta, who is the director of our Richard West Assistive Technology Advocacy Center. Mike has and will be our wizard behind the curtain and will be moderating this webinar for us today. Uh, Mike's gonna cover some of the housekeeping and then we will begin. Thanks, Bill. I, haven't be I haven't been called a wizard in days. That's exciting. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I was the voice you heard as you came in, that wizardly voice from behind the screen. A uh, couple housekeeping things, not many actually, because it seems like we're all in and it looks like everything's moving along. Uh, if you haven't found your chat button yet, uh, search the toolbar that uh, Zoom provides for you. It may be either a button right on that toolbar or you may have to search under more. And then you'll be able to find the chat box if you have questions or comments you want to drop in there. Uh, again, Michael and Jill and myself will, mod will monitor that throughout the uh, webinar, and we'll get to that at the end. Uh, if you have any um, issues on your end, technology-wise, you can also, through that chat, directly message me if you'd like. Uh, I, you could be, find my name in that chat and send me a message, and I can try to help you as well. Uh, we are recording this, and it will end up after today's live session on our uh, ATAC YouTube channel. And so if you signed up today, we will make sure to send you a link to the recording to view it at a later date. So again, thanks for being here. Thank you, Mike. So a little bit about DRNJ. We are the designated protection and advocacy agency in the state of New Jersey. We are part of a national network of protection and advocacy agencies in every state with the unique federal authority to monitor settings where individuals with disabilities live, work, and receive services. We investigate complaints of abuse and neglect. We provide legal representation and legal advocacy services to individuals with disabilities whose complaints are within our priorities. We also participate in outreach activities provide information and referral, and conduct educational trainings like this one to individuals with disabilities, their family members, professionals, and other advocates and attorneys. Next slide. So what we will cover today, we are going to explain how to request appeals and preserve your rights when a managed care organization denies, reduces, or terminates your benefits. We will explain to you what rights you have during the appeal process. 
We're going to walk you step by step through the internal appeals process up to and including requesting a Medicaid fair hearing. We're going to show you examples of notices, explain the timelines, and most importantly, we'll cover how you can ensure that your benefits will continue throughout the appeals process. Next slide, please. So let's start with the basics. New Jersey operates a Medicaid program in partnership with the federal government to ensure medical coverage for our most vulnerable citizens. Individuals who are on Medicaid can choose to enroll or they're auto-enrolled in one of the five managed care organizations or MCOs, Horizon United, Amerigroup, Aetna, and WellCare. The MCO contracts with the state to maintain a network of providers and to make payment for approved Medicaid services. So the MCO is responsible for authorizing your services under their plans. When the MCO makes a determination that denies, reduces, or terminates your services, that's called an adverse benefit determination. I'm gonna give you some specific examples of that in a minute. Continuation of benefits is an important term that you're gonna hear a lot today because it is so important. The term is for continuing your same level of benefits or services throughout the duration of your appeal. Next slide, please. So what is a notice of adverse benefit determination? Whenever your MCO makes an adverse benefit determination, they must provide you with a written notice. Some examples of things that are considered adverse benefit determinations, I explained below. If you're receiving 35 hours a week of personal care assistance, but the MCO does a reassessment and reduces your services to 15 hours a week, your MCO terminates your coverage for rehabilitation services because they believe you're no longer benefiting, or your MCO denies a pre-authorization for surgery your doctor has prescribed because they think it's not medically necessary, are all examples of adverse benefit determinations that would require a written notice. Next slide, please. So again, when we're talking about the adverse benefit determination, the notice must be provided in writing. Your care manager or your agency delivering the services can't just tell you over the phone or in person that your benefit's being reduced and expect that to serve as your notice. It has to be in writing. So when you receive this kind of notice or any notice really from your MCO, keep it. You're also going to want to keep the date stamped envelope that the notice comes in. The dates on the notice are very important factors for determining your continuation of benefits. The MCO must mail the notice at least 10 days before the date of the action. You may not receive it 10 days before, but if it's date stamped 10 days, it's still valid. So that's why it's very important to keep the notice and the envelope. In just a minute, I'm gonna turn it over to Michael, who's gonna take you step-by-step step through requesting the appeal. But first, I want to go over some of your rights throughout the process. Next slide, please. So these are some of your rights that you are going to want to keep in mind while you're going through an appeal process. Your MCO must provide you with reasonable assistance to help you file the appeal, such as providing an interpreter if requested. The MCO must provide you with confirmation that they received your appeal. You're entitled to a free copy of your entire case file from the MCO in advance of the deadline to appeal. You should make that request from them and you should make that request in writing. You have the opportunity to submit new documents that were not considered at the time of the initial decision, such as a doctor's letter. You have the opportunity to present documents testimony and arguments in person, and you have the right to the assistance of a representative of your choosing, such as a friend, a family member, an advocate, or an attorney. So now that I've laid out some of the basics, Michael is going to take you step by step through actually requesting the appeal and we will be happy to take on any questions at the conclusion. 
So next slide, Michael. Thanks, Jill. And good afternoon, everybody. I'm Michael Brower, one of the attorneys with Disability Rights New Jersey. And as Jill said, I work alongside her on our community inclusion team. Now that Jill's laid out some of the groundwork, let's take a look at an actual notice. Uh, up on the screen here, we have a notice. Um, most notices are gonna look just like this one. Um, obviously, we've redacted any personally identifying information. So instead of black boxes, uh, if you were to receive a notice, you would see your MCO's corporate logo, your name, your address, and your personal identifying information. There's a couple of big red arrows up on the screen. And the reason I put those here is that's the two most important things to look at if you get a notice, and it's where I would look first. The top arrow is pointing at the date of the notice. That is the date that the managed care organization generated this notice. And presumably it's the same date that they made the decision. The second arrow is going to point to the actual action that the MCO was proposing to take. Um, in this situation, and the notice that's up on the screen, it's a little small, but what they're proposing to do is to deny someone's request for private duty nursing services. It also includes on the action a date that that action will go into effect. Because, as Jill mentioned, any notice that reduces or terminates an existing service must be issued at least 10 days in advance. The note, the date that the action goes into effect and the date the notices are issued um, should be 10 days apart in a situation like that. I'm here because the MCO is denying a request for services that haven't been in place before. You'll see that the date of the notice is May 9th. Any action, the denial of private duty nursing services is effective May 2nd. So what we have here is an individual who requested services on May 2nd, the MCO made a decision about a week later and wrote the letter on May 9th. Next slide, please. So the reason some of those dates are so important, why they're the first thing that I look at is because the continuation of benefits, if you have an existing services, hinges on your timing and your ability to meet some pretty tight deadlines. You can keep an ongoing benefit like personal care assistance, private duty nursing, or even physical therapy services while you go through the appeal process. This means that if you make an appeal within 10 days of the date of the notice or before the reduction takes place, whichever one happens later, you will not lose your services until you reach a final decision on your appeal. If you miss those deadlines, you might still be able to appeal, but the ongoing services could and likely will be cut off during your appeal. It's important, I put it in bold, I'm probably gonna say this enough times to annoy you, but it's not automatic to get a continuation of benefits during the appeal process. You need to meet the deadlines and affirmatively make a request for a continuation of benefits to avail yourself of that right. Next slide, please. Now we have up on the screen a calendar. And just to go through an example, to make sure that this is crystal clear, because sometimes there's a few technicalities. When do you start counting days? How do you know if you submitted your appeal on time? In my example on this calendar here, this is a calendar of May 2019. And the green circle is May 8th, the date that the notice was issued by the managed care organization. To start counting days, you'll see those red X's. We start with the day after, that's day one of the 10 day period. And then we count 10 days all the way up through May the 18th, or May the 18th is the 10th day after the MCO issued the notice. You have a very short deadline here. That means that before the end of the day on May 18th, this person would have to make their appeal to the MCO and request a continuation of benefits Otherwise, they might stop receiving any ongoing services that were subject to this denial or reduction. Like Jill had said before, there's a presumption that the MCO mails the notice on the same day that it's dated. So here for a notice dated May 8th, the MCO is required by federal law to drop it in the mail the same day. That doesn't always happen, which is why it's important if you receive an envelope with a date stamp, especially if that date stamp is later than the date of the letter itself, to save that envelope. It may be a way to protect your rights if, for example, the MCO created or made their decision on the 8th, 
but didn't mail it until much later, say the 16th or 17th, so that you didn't have a chance to make an appeal, holding onto that envelope is a good way to go back and prove that you were not at fault. Otherwise, though, the deadline is still short. Even if the MCO mails it right on the 8th, it may take two to three days in the mail before that envelope lands in your mailbox, leaving you with only a few short days to decide whether you want to appeal and to get your appeal in on time. Next slide, please. So we've talked a little about, about getting your appeal in on time, but what actually am I talking about? The first step in the current system of Medicaid managed, managed care appeals is the internal appeal. The internal appeal is a decision, like we said, to, I'm sorry, sorry, rather, is a appeal that you're making against an MCO's decision to reduce, terminate, or to deny a requested service that you're making for the first time. An action could also be a partial denial. Um, Jill had mentioned that a partial reduction is considered an adverse benefit determination, a reduction from 35 to 10 hours per week of personal care assistance. But if you asked for 40 hours per week of personal care assistance and the MCO only approved 25 hours per week, that's a partial denial. So the internal appeal is saying to an MCO, I disagree. I want you, the MCO, to take a second look at your decision. Next slide, please. And here's how we actually make the first contact to get yourself in under that deadline. All the MCOs are required to accept the first appeal by telephone, but there's also a requirement that you follow up any telephone appeals in writing. Up on the screen are the telephone numbers to the five MCOs that currently operate in New Jersey. Anytime you call them, you wanna make sure to keep a log. In addition to calls, you'd wanna keep a log of any emails, letters, or faxes that you send as part of your appeal. For a telephone call, we would want to ask the MCO representative that you speak with for their name, their employee ID number, and a reference number for the call. You're going to write all that down in your log in case there's ever a dispute later about whether you called on time or not. Next slide, please. It bears repeating that if you want the benefits to continue, you must request your internal appeal, which can be done with the telephone call, within 10 days of the date of the notice or before the reduction actually goes into effect or the termination goes into effect, whichever is later. Sometimes you might get lots of notice, more than the minimum 10 days, which means you might have a little bit more time. My rule of thumb is I always try to act within that first 10 days to avoid cutting it too close in a deadline and losing important services. Like I said before, the best practice is always to follow up a telephonic request for an internal appeal with a written appeal. And a written follow-up should include any evidence that you want the MCO to review. And that includes, like Jill said, any new prescriptions, letters of medical necessity from a doctor, or maybe even medical records that might indicate why the managed care organization has made the wrong decision about your care. Next slide, please. Up on the screen, we have an example of a written follow-up and this one's pretty basic, but it would meet all the requirements that you'd have to do in order for your written follow-up to meet the requirements of federal law. Ideally, this person would also include any other documents they wanted that MCO to review, again, like letters from a doctor or from a caregiver. You can send this written follow-up by mail to the MCO or by fax. If you use mail, be sure to use certified mail, something with a tracking number on it. That way, if the MCO claims not to receive it, you have proof on your own that it was sent on time and that the MCO received it on a certain date. If you use fax, make sure that the time and the calendar and your fax machine are set correctly so that when you get your fax confirmation, you can be sure that it's accurate and that you can affirmatively tell somebody when you sent the fax and when the MCO's fax machine received it. Next slide, please. Once the MCO receives your internal appeal, they'll start reviewing their own decision. Once they've made a decision, they'll send you their answer in writing. This new document is called a notice of resolution. You're gonna hear that again and we'll have an example in just a second. It, it's good to have in mind that very rarely, like the rest of us, when the MCO looks at its own decision, very rarely is it going to change its own mind. It's pretty common on an internal appeal for the MCO to uphold its earlier decision um, because again, the MCO is looking at its own decision here. Um, 
it's important to know that now we've gone through, once you receive a notice of resolution, you've gone through the internal appeal process and it's complete. The next step of the process is gonna be a Medicaid fair hearing. But before we get there, let's take a look at a notice of resolution. Next slide, please. All right, up on the screen now, we have a redacted notice of resolution. And just like before, those black boxes are things that I inserted to protect uh, confidentiality. Um, normally you'd see MCO logos, personal identifying information there instead. Again, there's a big red arrow, taking a look at the date. And again, the date is very important. Once you receive the notice of resolution, a new clock starts ticking. Um, that clock is another 10 days. Uh, and if you want to have a continuation of benefits, you've got 10 days from the date of the notice of resolution in order to request a fair hearing and continue on the process without losing your benefits. The body of the notice down below explains what the MCO did with your internal appeal, whether they changed their mind or whether they're keeping their original decision. Uh, if there's any new reasoning or rationale, that information will also be inserted in the body of the letter. Next slide, please. Like I said before, the next step in the process, assuming you didn't get a favorable result from your internal appeal, is to go to a Medicaid fair hearing. If the notice of resolution tells you that the MCO is still going to terminate or reduce your services, or if they're still not going to approve a service that you asked for, now you have the opportunity to request a fair hearing. A fair hearing is a chance to present your case to a neutral administrative law judge who makes a recommendation to the state Medicaid director. The Medicaid director then makes a final agency decision about what should happen with your services. To make a request for a fair hearing, you must write to the Division of Medical Assistance and Health Services, which is New Jersey's state Medicaid agency. And we're gonna talk about how to actually do that next. Next slide, please. Up here on the screen are actually pages two and three of that notice of resolution we had on the screen just a second ago. Um, this is the fair hearing request form, and it's enclosed, required to be enclosed with the notice of resolution. You normally can't skip a step, meaning you can't skip right to the fair hearing until after you've gone through that internal appeal process. So this document will arrive just in time for you to request your fair hearing. You're gonna to wanna to make a note that on this form is a small section for you to fill out uh, the reasoning for your request for a fair hearing. It doesn't have to be complicated. You can simply say, I disagree with a decision. That's, that's sufficient. But more importantly, there's also a box, or in this case, a line on the second page of the form that you must check to request a continuation of benefits. Again, the timing on this form is that you must submit it within 10 days of the date of the notice of resolution. This is counted the same way we talked about on the initial notice. So you can refer back to the calendar if you want to, to calculate the number of days that you have to submit the request for fair hearing. It's worth noting that New Jersey law does provide for individuals who request a fair hearing. If they are ultimately unsuccessful, the MCO is allowed to try to collect back the cost of services that were distributed during the process and then were ultimately found to be medically unnecessary. We find this to be so extremely uncommon that I've never seen it happen. I'm generally not too concerned with it. Um, usually for folks on Medicaid, they don't have any money to collect from anyway. It's also, I think, politically unpopular to collect against folks with disabilities or folks on Medicaid. Um, in all the years of our experience, we've never seen it happen. Next slide, please. All right, so just to kind of sum up where we are so far, I've got a flow chart here that lays all the steps out that we've gone through in order. We started by receiving the initial denial or reduction notice from the MCO. That's the Notice of Adverse Benefit Determination. Uh, within 60 days of that date, we filed our internal appeal, but we wanted continuation of benefits, so we did it within 10 days to make sure that we didn't lose any ongoing services. The managed care organization took their time. They have up to 30 days to make their decision on the internal appeal. And then we received their decision, the internal appeal called the Notice of Resolution. That started another clock ticking and we got our notice in within 10 days, our request for a fair hearing. Even though ultimately you have 120 days to make that request, if you wait past the 10 days, you're very unlikely and probably will not get a continuation of benefits. 
Next slide, please. I really can't say this enough, and I told you in the beginning, you're probably going to be annoyed by me talking about continuation of benefits and how important it is. But if you have an ongoing service like personal care assistance, private duty nursing, or some type of ongoing therapy, you can keep those benefits during the appeal process, but only if you are making requests for appeal on time. That means requesting your internal appeal within 10 days of the date on the initial notice or before the action goes into effect, whichever is later, and requesting a fair hearing within 10 days on the date of the notice of resolution if your internal appeal was not favorable. If you miss either deadline, the proposed termination or reduction could go into effect before you have your fair hearing. You might win at the end of the day, and you might ultimately get your services back, but you'll have to wait for the hearing to be completed, for the judge to schedule, hear from all the witnesses. The judge has to issue and write the recommendation to the Medicaid director, and the Medicaid director has to make a final decision. Because these are all bureaucratic processes, even when they move fast, it normally takes several months to get a decision from a fair hearing. This is why it's so important to make sure that you meet the deadlines and have a continuation of benefits. Many of my clients could not survive without a private duty nurse because it's medically necessary, or they might not be able to meet basic personal care needs without a personal care assistant. To imagine somebody going through months of litigation without the benefit of those services is a frightening concept, which is why I'm highlighting it uh, with such big bold letters and here all caps. Next slide, please. So far, we've been talking about how the system is supposed to work. And anybody who's ever dealt with the system knows that's not always how it goes. Uh, we hear a lot of common problems and there's a few that really jump out as things that we would see with some regularity. Um, we would hear from folks that their Medicaid service was reduced. Maybe they got a call from their personal care agency and said, hey, your, your managed care organization has terminated the services. We can't come out tomorrow. But that person never received any written notice from their managed care organization. Or maybe that person got the written notice and they made their appeal on time. They got well within that 10 day limit. Um, they even asked for a continuation of benefits affirmatively and in writing, but those services were stopped anyway. Unfortunately, these kinds of scenarios aren't terribly uncommon. The good news is the Division of Medical Assistance and Health Services, abbreviated DMOS, um, operates an office of quality monitoring. Um, these folks, play the role of making sure that the managed care organizations who are ultimately our state contractors are holding up their end of the bargain and following the rules of the state contract. Part of the state contract and the federal regulations require advance notice and require continuation of benefits. There's no discretion there. Um, so I would recommend if you experience something like this, the Office of Quality Monitoring, their phone number is up there. I find them to be very responsive, very friendly folks. Um, they can help square away issues like this and help you break down any kind of communication barrier with a managed care organization to get something like this resolved and get it resolved quickly. Um, they can't fix, you know, disputes that I think my managed care organization got it wrong. The Office of Quality Monitoring is not going to be able to help with that. That needs to get addressed through the appeal process, but something black and white, like never receiving a notice or not getting a continuation of benefits, that's the kind of issue I would call them about. While we're talking here, I'm not quite at the end yet, but I wanna let you know if you have any questions, um, you can be putting those in the chat box. Like Mike said, you can use the menu system to open up the chat, maybe under the more uh, drawer on your, your menu box. Um, you can put those down here. I would advise, please don't put anything personal because everybody can see the chat. So general questions, please. And if you have anything specific, I'll be putting up DRNJ's contact information for our intake folks um, up at the end of the slide deck. That way, anything, if you have a personal request or a request for assistance in a specific case, you can use that process to contact us. Next slide, please. Another common problem that we see um, is somebody saying there's a time crunch of some kind. So if you meet those 10 day deadlines and you have an ongoing service and you go through the internal appeal and the fair hearing process, you're going to be in an okay or a comfortable situation because you're going to be able to take your time. You'll be receiving your services and you can go through the whole steps. You can wait for decisions, prepare your case and not be worried. If you miss the deadline and your services get cut off, or if you're asking for a new service for the first time, and if you not having that service is going to put you in some type of jeopardy, whether that's to your life, your health or your functioning, 
you can ask to expedite the internal appeal. An expedited internal appeal shortens the MCO part of the process down from 30 days to 72 hours. Basically, you can push fast forward in almost an entire month to get to that internal appeal decision more quickly. Um, in order to do that, you have to request an expedited appeal from the managed care organization and explain to them why waiting for the service would jeopardize your life, physical or mental health, or your ability to attain, maintain, or regain maximum functioning. Next slide, please. All right, so I wanna open this up for questions. Um, like we talked about a couple of times, questions can go in the chat box on the side or at the bottom, depending what platform you're on. And we'll take a look at those and try to answer anything we can. Um, the elephant, it's pretty nice. I like it with the question mark there. I'm like, if we wanna to go to the next slide with the contact information, that might be better to leave up as the background while we see if any questions come in through the chat. Perfect, thanks. So this is Jill. I just wanted to um, mention we did get um, a comment that a question was sent to our advocate um, email address. We're not monitoring that in real time during this webinar, but um, any emails with questions or issues that are directed to our advocate email will be answered. They'll be routed through our intake specialists um, to our advocates and attorneys. While we wait to see if a question comes in through the chat box, um, I just wanted to share a little bit of strategy that might be good for either the internal appeal or the fair hearing process, um, just to kind of maybe do a preview. Um, we're hoping that this webinar becomes part of a series that would take you through an entire um, Medicaid appeals process and includes other things like how to actually prosecute a fair hearing, um, common pitfalls there, Medicaid eligibility, things like that. But there's one piece of strategy that might be good to apply even at the internal appeal level. And it's a pretty basic two-part strategy. If you disagree with an MCO's decision, you want to produce as much medical documentation as you can that number one, the decision was wrong. Uh, maybe the MCO overlooked the disability you have or how it affects your ability to function. For example, if we're talking about private duty nursing, maybe they just missed that you have a skilled nursing service and, and all the documentation they provided, it's clear they just missed it. Number one, point out how that's wrong. Hey, you guys just missed something. Number two, I always tell everybody, you wanna make an affirmative case. Um, even if the MCO is just understating what you need or otherwise, it's good to produce medical documentation with your doctor, if we're talking about nursing with your nurses, if we're talking about personal care with your personal care aide, to explain why you actually need the service even if it's something that you've had for years and years and years. It's a good idea to go both ways. Oh, we're getting some good questions in the chat box. I'm glad we're getting this. I love activity. Let's see what we have so far. Okay, I see one question here about the expedited appeal language and it is very broad. You're right. Um, how often do I use it? I try to never use it, um, if at all possible. I try to make sure that I maintain the continuation of benefits for a client. Um, and I would always advise anyone calling in for advice to do the same thing. That's always the best answer is to have your services continue through the process. Um, the only time if I've missed that deadline, either because someone came to us too late, of course, there's some kind of confusion going on with the case on what's actually happening and the deadline has passed, that would be a time I use it. Um, and like I said, if somebody's requesting services for the first time, um, an example comes to mind about an important surgery where if they waited around for 30 days for the MCO to make an internal decision, um, their medical condition might get you know, really seriously bad and might jeopardize someone's life. That might be another example where they request a expedited appeal. Um, again, I think documentation is important. If your doctor can set down in writing why your life might be in jeopardy if something is put on the back burner, I think that would be helpful to make sure that you get through the expedited appeal process and don't have to wait that first month. We have a question, does DRNJ assist children um, with IDD on Medicaid? And the answer to that question is yes. 
Um, the scope of services that we would provide would depend on the individual circumstances, but, but yes, we do assist, provide assistance to children as well as adults. Yeah, that's, that's a true one, Joe. We definitely look at every case that comes through the door. Um, anybody who's got some kind of a reduction of services, we're going to be able to help you somehow. It may be advice. It may be full representation. Uh, we look carefully at every case that comes in through our intake. Um, I see um, Erica has asked a question in the chat. They're expecting a reduction of services, private duty nursing, specifically once a child turns 21. Anything to do in advance? Um, yeah, there is actually some, there's some proactive steps you can take. Um, I would first want to talk to the doctor who's prescribed the private duty nursing, any specialists who are involved in the child's care who might have something to say about the skilled nursing services. When it comes to private duty nursing, it's all about documenting what are the skilled nursing services, um, how long does it take to deliver them. Um, for a child who's younger than 21, they're entitled to receive all of the nursing services that are medically necessary. It gives a little bit more latitude. It could be theoretically up to 24 hours per day. Um, for adults, there is a limitation in the regulations um, that caps functionally, and I'm oversimplifying this a little bit, but it functionally caps adult private duty nursing services um, at 16 hours per day. And also, it's important to remember that for adults, and adults being anyone over 21, can only get private duty nursing if you're on MLTSS, that's the Managed Long-Term Services and Supports Waiver, or DDD's Supports Plus PDN Waiver. Um, adults on vanilla NJ Family Care Medicaid alone generally are not eligible to receive private duty nursing through Medicaid. So there is a question about, um, does this appeal process include PPP? and level determined by DDD. Um, it's actually a pretty common question. And, and those are actually two separate um, service streams. So if I can explain the PPP, this personal preference program um, is, a, is a delivery system for your PCA services that are authorized by your managed care organization. And yes, would be covered through this appeal process. Um, your level determine your level for um, IDD services that is determined through DDD is um, is a separate process and that actually goes through DDD and is determined through an assessment process called the NJ cat um, it is a slightly different system uh, to appeal that determination than it is for this because we're talking about two separate systems. Um, and that is actually probably a, a whole separate topic we could do. <laughs> we could do. All right, Denise wrote in, um, she wants to know about um, potentially owing the value of benefits back if somebody asks for the continuation of benefits and the end they still get denied after going through a fair hearing. Um, Denise and I talked about this a little bit. I don't want to uh, give you a short shrift, but the, the short answer is the federal law and the state law both allow for the state or the MCO to try to collect back that money for a benefit that was continued and ultimately found to still be denied or reduced. Um, however, um, in all the years that I've been at DRNJ and we've got several attorneys, I've got historical knowledge that goes back to when the managed care organizations first came in, in the mid 2010s. Uh, we have never seen it happen. Um, even in some pretty, you know, significant value cases that were ultimately lost. Uh, we haven't seen anyone ever get chased for the value of benefits. And again, I think that comes from two things. One, generally people on Medicaid don't have a lot of resources or income. It's kind of by, by definition. Um, and number two, I think it would be pretty unpopular for the state to be chasing down its most um, needy individuals, the folks who are determined to need medical coverage through the state, um, chase them down for money. Um, I don't know if that's actually what it is. That's a little bit of me imposing my thought process on it. Um, but we just, we know we've never seen it happen. A question about the 10 day turnaround when the date on the letter does not match the um, post date on the envelope. Um, 
yes, you're correct in why we stress to you to keep the envelope with the post date so um, that you can show when the MCO actually mailed the document if there's a large discrepancy between that date and the date that is on the letter. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add on to that a little bit, Jill, if it's okay. Um, that would also be probably a good issue if you want, if you had a problem where the MCO didn't mail it or sat on it for so long before mailing it that you didn't have a chance to get your appeal in under the 10 day deadline. Um, and that could happen either at the first stage when they initially send you the notice of adverse benefit determination, or it could happen on the notice of resolution after you've gone through the internal appeal. Um, if that delay is so long that you can't get your next appeal in on time, hang on to your envelope, pick up the phone, and call the Medicaid quality monitoring folks. Um, that would be something they probably want to hear from you about anyway, just to let them know that the contractor is doing something a little bit shaky. Um, plus, they might also be able to help you get your services turned back on since missing the deadline potentially wasn't a fault of your own. Now, if you get the notice on day seven and you still have three days to do it, I wouldn't wait around and rely on that. I would still file my appeal right away. Um, but if you get the notice on day 11 or 12, for example, or even later, um, you want to be able to show you know, where that delay came from. Let's see. And question from Mary about being dropped from the um, personal care program. I I'm, I'm going to use a little interpretation and, and I believe uh, you're talking about termination of service. So that would really fall into the termination category, um, termination of personal care assistance and um, is exactly the kind of thing that we're talking about here um, that is subject to an appeal. All right, Rhonda has a, hi Rhonda, um, has a question about the coronavirus. Of course, there's nothing that's safe from the coronavirus these days. And I don't mean to say that lightly, it's, it's affecting everything. Um, will the coronavirus, will there be any exceptions made? Um, my understanding, and I think we could check with the um, Department of Human Services website, they have a dedicated COVID-19 website. I would point you there, Rhonda, um, to verify. Um, my understanding is that all prior authorizations, meaning people who are currently receiving services that were ongoing, personal care assistance, private duty nursing, therapy, that kind of thing, um, all of those were extended for at least 90 days from the middle of March um, so that there wouldn't be too many terminations going through the system. Um, I also understand right now that the Office of Administrative Law, where all of the fair hearings are held, um, is only hearing... Uh, emergent cases, they're not hearing all of the normal flow. So my understanding is they're putting a lot of things on hold there too. Um, I don't have a lot of fine detail on that, so I don't wanna dive in where I don't know and give you bad information. Those are the two things that I have some confidence on, um, but I would direct you to the Department of Human Services COVID-19 website, and you'll see links there about Medicaid services and explaining any adjustments to policy that have been made. It also, since this is recorded and someone may be listening a little bit later, um, since those things tend to change hour by hour or day by day, um, that's gonna be the most uh, up-to-date source of information on any um, changes to the policy to adapt for COVID-19. Um, I'm gonna jump in and take the next one too. Uh, specialized equipment, yes, if you're making a specialized equipment request through your managed care organization and, and it's denied, um, that would also be something that's subject to the fair hearing process that we're talking about here with the internal appeal first, it's followed up by a fair hearing if that's not favorable. Um, anytime we're requesting anything from your managed care organization and it's a covered service, they should be um, issuing an adverse benefit determination if they don't agree with your request. Um, and if they don't, again, that's an issue. We've given you some instructions on how to address it if they don't. see. Crystal. Hi, Crystal. Um, Paul, I addressed your question, I think, with the one above it, so I'm going to roll those two, and I hope I didn't give you a short shrift. Um, Crystal uh, says, when we lose Medicaid and your service provider causes havoc with billing, um, is there advice on how to work with Social Security and Medicaid? Um, so I think Medicaid eligibility is a slightly different beast. 
um, because your managed care organization doesn't make a determination on that one. Uh, I think gonna probably save that for a later webinar, which we have in the works on Medicaid eligibility. Um, for Medicaid eligibility right now, um, I'm part of the federal relief that was passed in the first round of legislation um, calls on states to stop, or actually require states to stop any um, terminations from Medicaid eligibility as a whole. Um, so right now that should not be happening. And so according to the legislation, anyone who was enrolled as of March the 18th of 2020 um, should stay on Medicaid until the federal emergency is declared over. Uh, so hopefully there'll be some protection there. Um, I don't want to dive into the details in that, Crystal, sorry about that, on Social Security and Medicaid. It's a topic for a different day, I think. Yeah, again, another one of those areas that deserves its own own webinar. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Benny asks a great question here, and I'm, I'm going to go back through some of the other ones, but Benny just jumped out at me. Is it a good idea to try and get a PCA, a nurse, or another provider to make a statement or testimony to challenge something like a reduction in PCA hours? Are they viewed as biased because they wouldn't want their hours reduced? Are there any other red flags that might come up? Um, it's a great question, Benny. I, you're really getting to the heart of, of the strategy part of this. Um, that's probably a good idea. Um, if I were representing somebody, either in the internal appeal or in a fair hearing, I would really love to hear from their providers. Nobody's going to know how much care it takes to care for somebody, either themselves or their care providers. If somebody's doing hands-on care day in and day out, can't ask for somebody who's got better knowledge. Sure, there's a little bit of a conflict. You know, they might be getting paid to do all that and they don't want to get their pay or their hours cut. Um, but at the end of the day, if you've got somebody who's a straight shooter, who can be honest, who's not going to pull their pay into the conversation, um, both at the internal appeal level, if they can make a statement on how long it takes to provide personal care, or even at the fair hearing level, if they come to court and testify, um, a judge is really going to want that kind of an insight. Um, because if you think about it, the managed care organization is also biased. You know, they, they don't want to pay for services. They want to save a couple of dollars by paying for less. Um, so both sides really have a little bit of bias. Everybody wants to win if they're involved in a dispute. Um, but your personal care aide, who's there day in and day out, might have a little bit more intimate knowledge than a managed care nurse who maybe only sees you for, you know, an hour every six months. Um, so I think that would be something to look at there. Um, now, obviously, if you think your, your aide is going to come across as dishonest or maybe, you know, in it all for themselves, it's a different story. You've got to measure that up, you know witness by witness whenever you present somebody to support your case. Um, Michael, there's a question about um, MCOs dropping providers. Yeah. I, am I putting you on the spot asking you to? You're not. I'm looking at that one right now from Emily. Um, is there any recourse? So the recourse for an MCO dropping a provider is not going to be through the internal appeal process or the fair hearing process. It's just not going to be addressed that kind of way. That's not the question that anyone there would be answering. Um, there is a grievance process um, through the MCOs. It's also prescribed um, by law. Um, it's a little bit more in depth. It's, it's not quite the same as the internal appeal process. Um, and I know that a shortage of specialists is a particular concern across the Medicaid spectrum as a whole. Um, partly it comes down to a political question because Medicaid doesn't pay enough to get a whole bunch of providers to really line up and sign up. Um, wouldn't be a bad idea to contact some of the regulators, um, contact the MCO to let them know what's going wrong if there's a shortage. Potentially they can help if they don't already know about it. Um, if they have already known about it and you really can't get any assistance, I'm uh, reaching out to the Division of Medical Assistance and Health Services through their website. Um, not necessarily a quality monitoring issue, this particular one. Um, for the Office of Quality Monitoring, it probably wouldn't be a good fit. Um, but reaching out to the Division of Medical Assistance and Health Services on their website would be a good way to go to let them know um, you've got a managed care org who's got an insufficient network. Um, ultimately, one of the reasons that the state implemented the managed care system instead of doing everything directly through the state was to bring a little bit of privatization into the Medicaid system to allow some market forces and competition to help improve services. 
Um, so yeah, that's also what Emily was mentioning as far as switching MCOs. It's also a choice if you think you've got a network that's better in one MCO versus the one that you're currently enrolled with. Um, there's open enrollment periods and under some circumstances, um, you can jump from one MCO to another, even if you're not in an open enrollment period. Instructions for all of that are at the njfamilycare.com website, uh, which explains how you can switch between managed care organizations. All right. I've got some really good questions. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is fantastic participation. And the questions really show me that the, these folks here in the webinar are tuned in to some of the hot issues. Um, I don't see any new questions in the chat and we're coming up on being out of time. I wanna give it just another minute in case anyone has anything else to throw into the chat box before we sign off. And of course, if you have something that's very specific to your, to your own um, individual case, uh, there's all of our contact information. Feel free to reach out to us um, through our intake. And it's important to add probably, even though DRNJ, like a lot of other organizations, we are working remotely, we are open for business, our intake is functioning, um, you will reach a voicemail most likely rather than getting a live person on the phone, um, but we're checking that with, very frequently. Um, so if you do have something specific, um, do feel free to reach out to the intake and get something opened up. If you have a question, we can look at your case a little bit more specifically and give you some more targeted guidance or advice. Oh, okay, one more from Benny. If the MCO denies something like an MRI or physical therapy, what types of evidence are you going to look for challenging this denial? Um, with those, they're medical procedures. Uh, you know, physical therapy is a little bit closer to a medical procedure rather than an ongoing thing like uh, personal care assistance or private duty nursing, depending on the circumstances. Some folks need physical therapy as a, a long-term or permanent situation to maintain their functioning. Um, but in either of those cases, the first stop is going to be to talk to the doctor who prescribed it. Um, why did you prescribe this? Why is it medically necessary? A lot of times that's, that's the, the kind of the lever point on questions about particular, like we're talking about an MRI, a single procedure is why did you need this? Why wouldn't something else work? If the MCO says, oh, you don't need an MRI, an x-ray would be fine. Ask the doc, hey doc, you prescribed an MRI. Why? And that doctor hopefully can give you some explanation for why an MRI is so important or why it's necessary for your particular uh, condition. Um, if they can't, well, maybe that's an indication that the alternative service might work better. Um, if they can, then that gives you your basis to go back and put together your internal appeal or the fair hearing if you get that far. Um, obviously, like I said before, if the doctor can write that all down in a letter, provide records, if they've tried, you know, the x-ray, like the, the, the cheaper process first, and that, that doesn't give them enough resolution to see whether you need surgery or not, things like that. Um, any kind of documentation that shows how they came to that decision process, open up their brain to the managed care organization, that's going to be how you frame that kind of an appeal. All right, I'm not seeing anything else in the chat box. Jill or Mike, do you see anything else popping up in the questions? No, and, and we seem to be coming up on time, so. All right, well, I really wanna thank everybody, um, Jill and Mike uh, in particular, for helping put this all together um, and all the participants who came on board and asked some really great questions. It's, it's been a pleasure to you know, get out of the work at home world a little bit and talk to some people out in the world about Medicaid managed care and how to appeal.